Friday morning. Welcome to Noah's Window. As we shared with you a couple of days ago, Mary Alice and I are taking a few days off. We have dear friends who have opened their house to us on South Padre, and we're having a great time. We're relaxing and resting and spending time in God's Word, and we're thankful that you're joining us. Acts chapter 9 is one of these pivotal chapters in the Bible where there's an enormous transition that's about to take place. And I would say that most theologians would call this chapter, if they were to give it a title, The Conversion of Paul. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening here, at least in part. You have Paul, who is going to be saved. He, we know him now as Saul. So, Marielle, would you share some scriptures with us as we open this story? Yes, we're, we're moving to chapter 9. And again, as you just said, we're still, we still know him here as Saul. And uh, maybe you should talk a little bit about that name, because he was known by two names, right? Right, right. Uh, and, you know, there's a little bit of a question mark here because some would say that Saul was his Jewish name and Paul was his Roman mm -hmm. name. Could be true. And yet we've also heard stories of how that God changed his name from Saul to Paul. Uh, that's possible, too. It, it's just one of those things the Bible doesn't address. Mm -hmm. Saul means asked for. Uh, it means someone who is uh, big. And Paul means small. And so some mm -hmm. theologians through the years have said, well, they assume that God changed his name from Saul to Paul because, first of all, it means small. And secondly, Paul was going to speak primarily to a Gentile audience, ultimately. I don't know. The scripture but, just doesn't give us yeah, that. You know, and, and, and that's the case. Sometimes mm -hmm. um, scripture doesn't, doesn't speak to it, and, and we have to just look at it and say, well, we don't know for sure. It could be this or it could be that. But at the end of the day, we really don't know. Don't and it doesn't, doesn't change no. anything that's of importance no, as we're reading it. Okay, so we got introduced to Saul at uh, Stephen Stoney, really. <laughs> And so now we're going we're gonna to pick up his story here in chapter 9. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. A dramatic story. Yes, and so much here. Mm. The Bible tells us here in the language of Saul's hatred of Christians is so strong. I mean, look at the expression in verse one, eager to kill. Mm. Unbelievable. I mean, and yet, and yet Saul would have thought he was the most religious man in the world. He would have seen himself as a godly person, as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he would later say. And yet he's got murder in his heart. And, and notice that he goes to the high priest, who, by the way, would have still been that same high priest who presided over the trial of Jesus. He goes to the high priest and he wants a rest warrant so that he can bring Christians back from Damascus. Now that's in Syria. I mean, he is invading basically another space in the country. Um, and but of course he'll go there with Lawrence, so it's all it's all legal and everything. But but um, Acts chapter nine makes something very clear. He wanted to bring both, back both men and women. That's that's a peculiar statement, and it raises a lot of questions in my mind as I look at Saul here. But he's going to make orphans out of kids. Mm -hmm. I mean that's the hatred that he has for Christianity. We feel that today. We feel we feel hatred. For Christianity, and it is that same satanic thing that Saul had in his heart. But as he was approaching Damascus, verse 3 says, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. Now, it's interesting to me that up until this point, you get this picture of spiritual darkness. I mean, mm -hmm. that is a darkness, right? Yeah. That's right. I mean, when 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 you when you, when you just want to kill Christians and you want to arrest men and women and bring them back in chains and rip them away from their kids, that is a darkness. So it's like God is sending a message to Saul. Saul, you're in darkness. I'm going to send you so much light you can't handle it. 
what do you think about that? And yet, he, and yet that lot renders him blind for three right. days. So there's a lot of back and forth contrast there. But yes, I love that because light always dispels darkness. In fact, darkness is the absence of light. That's a whole other topic. But, it is. But I do it's love good. this. And I love that when, when uh, Jesus talks to him, he didn't say, I'm the leader of the people that you're going after. He said, it's me that you're, it's yeah, me that you're persecuting. Because he asked the question. Jesus said, Saul, Saul. Now, when you see someone's name called twice, we know that in the Bible. This is a very serious conversation. This is not a casual statement. This is like Jesus is like verbally shaking him by the shoulders. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I think up till this point, Saul would have thought he wasn't persecuting Jesus because Jesus mm -hmm. was dead. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe he arose from the grave. Right, right. And then on top of that, Saul would have thought he was persecuting these people. And yet Jesus said, you don't realize this, but you're, you're persecuting mm -hmm. me personally. What do you think about that? Oh, I, it's just huge. And, um, and I love this. We talked about this a couple of days ago. In response, he asked that question we talked about. Who? Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? And that is the quintessential question that everyone should ask at some time in their life. But that is the key question, because he said, who are you, Lord? And that's when Jesus identifies himself. I'm Jesus. I'm the one that you're persecuting. That's interesting, too, because of all the names that Jesus could have used, he used his human name. Mm -hmm. He used the name that Saul would have said, well, lots of people, their name Jesus, you know, right, in those right. days. It, it's the Greek form of the name Joshua. I think... If you had asked Saul, what is it about these people you hate? I think he would have said they worship a dead man. Mm. They don't really worship God. They worship a man. And most of all, they worship a dead man. So I really believe that's why, and I can't prove this, but I think that's why Jesus used his human name. He could have said, I'm Christ. That would have been his mm -hmm. title. You know, Paul was familiar with the fact that the Messiah was coming. So if he had said, I'm Christ, I'm the Messiah, that had been one thing. But when he said, I am Jesus, you're not persecuting a dead man. You, it's an alive, I'm, I'm alive. I mean, I mean, all that must have dawned on Paul in, in just a moment of time. One more thing, though. Oh, I want to go back to uh, Jesus asking him the question, why are you persecuting me and being personal to the Lord? Um, you think about who came in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit. So all these believers are now sealed by the Spirit of God. We read that in the book of Ephesians. Now, if you were in our services on Easter, you may remember that I talked about the seal over the grave of Jesus. And, and that second point that I made about that was, if you mess with the seal of Rome, you take on the whole Roman government. Well, that's one thing. But when you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, you take on a daughter or a son of God, you're taking on heaven. You know, you're taking on the power of heaven. And that's what I think Jesus is saying to Saul. You, you picked a fight with somebody a whole lot bigger than you think you picked a fight with. And now correct me if I'm wrong, because it says that he, that there was a bright light. But when Saul is recounting this later, he said he saw the Lord. Mm. So Jesus must be standing there yeah. as he's speaking to him. It, 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 that's something else I want to go to, because skeptics through the years have made this uh, point since the men was... Saul didn't, didn't they, they heard something, but they didn't have the same complete experience that, that Saul had. There have been skeptics who have said that Saul had an epileptic seizure. Oh, and I love what Spurgeon, he said, blessed epilepsy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but of course it wasn't epilepsy. Paul was very definitive. He was very clear. He repeated this story again and again as he gave the gospel message. Uh, and I love this. I mean, Saul came to town. He was on his way to Damascus thinking he was going to tell everybody what to do. And now he's blind. He's having to be led by the hand. And the Lord is saying to Saul, you come on into Damascus and I'm going to tell you what you need to do. And then there's that downtime, the three days of blindness and fasting. And, uh, you know, I, we don't get insight into what all what that was like for him. But, I, you know, I, it makes me think of sometimes when we're in, in a period of, of darkness and, and waiting and stillness. That's when God does a, a great work, but it's, it can be challenging to be in that time. I think we just always have to have confidence that we're, we're entering into something special with God sometimes in those times. Well, it's interesting that you say that because, uh, you know, my favorite commentator is Harry Ironside. I love reading Harry Ironside. 
And so I was reading him on this chapter. He said the very thing that you just got through saying. He, he goes to that three days. I personally agree with that totally. My personal thought is this. Saul knew so much more about Jesus than he realized he knew. Because mm -hmm. he thoroughly knew the Old Testament. Yes. And I think it was in those three days of darkness that all of a sudden all those scriptures that he had memorized and learned Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Genesis 49, Numbers 24, Daniel chapter 7, you know, Micah chapter 5. I think in the darkness, all of a sudden it clicked for him. All these things, and it's like, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. That's who he is. Because we're going to read, and I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to read that, you know, when he started being able to see again, immediately he began to preach Jesus. I think in those three days, it was like it all came together for him. I think also there had to be, although it's not recorded for us, there had to be a lot of prayer. There had to be a lot of prayer going on. Right. And I think I think Saul got really acquainted with the Lord in I those believe, three days. Because in, in the absence of any distractions, he has to be talking to the Lord. I just I just believe that's a special three days that he spent with the Lord. I think his heart did 180. I mean, right. maybe the fullest 180 that anybody's heart ever did. He went from hating him, wanting to kill his followers, to loving him after those three days and wanting to tell the world whatever it cost him, which it mm -hmm. did cost him. He wanted to tell the world about this person that he had persecuted. You know, one more thing, and... Uh, and, I, and again, I, got, I read this from Harry Ironside today. He said, uh, Saul never forgave himself for persecuting That's Christians. True. He That's said true. God forgave him and the church forgave him. Those Christians he persecuted for him. But he could never get away from what he had done because he said, you know, I'm an apostle, but I'm the least of the apostles. And the chief of sinners. And the chief of sinners because I persecuted. You know, mm -hmm. he couldn't get away from that. But it's, this is just a great story. We're not finished with it because we got a whole lot more to talk about. But probably that's a good place to end today. It is. Amen. Pray for us, Maria. Yes, let's pray. Father, just thank you for recording this for us that we can look back. Thank you for all that you did that we can rejoice in because we know we are still beneficiaries of the great work that you did even all these centuries ago. I just pray that you would continue your work even today through us. Thank you for blessing us with your presence and with the privilege of spreading your good news to those that need to hear it even today. Lord, for the Noah's Window uh, audience today, those that are watching or listening, I just pray a special blessing on them today, on, on their children, on their grandchildren, on their day, on the activities, on the decisions that they make today. Father, may you guide them. I pray that you'd wrap them in your love, draw them into your presence, and uh, use us all for your glory and honor. Thank you for your great love for us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mary Alice. Thank you for joining us on Noah's Window. God willing, we'll see you tomorrow. Next week. We'll see you next week on Monday. That's right. Well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of messed well, up. Our days are a little yeah, confused right, right this, now. Yeah. This has been a, a different kind of week that I'm accustomed to. Yes. Well, we love you guys. We'll see you soon. We'll see you Monday. Yes. God bless. Bye.